Hello everybody! In this video I will quickly discuss the main concepts of Chapter 3 on numerical summaries of data. Uh, we began with measures of center and um, let's discuss what they are. So we have mean, median and mode, right? So let me see, mean is one of them, median and mode. Okay, um, typically students have very little trouble with these uh, concepts. So me mean is what? This is your average, right? Arithmetic average. Median is the middle value, right? If you were to arrange your data um, in ascendant or descendant order, it's the value that sits right in the middle, middle value. And mode is the most frequent, if there's any. Okay, so um, how do we find these things? If you have a set of data, the mean, uh, you, of course you can just add them all up or whatever the values are and divide by the number of observations. But um, we're not going to do that in this class. So use your calculator, do all the, um, all the work for you. So you plug in your data, let's say in L1, and then you use um, one variable statistics L1, um, the command that produces a whole bunch of characteristics of your um, set of data, and one of them is the mean, okay? And it will be x bar. Okay, then the median is the value in, that sits right in the middle. For this, um, for this particular uh, concept, what do we do? We arrange the values in ascending or descending order, and then we find the one that sits in the middle. That is, if you have an odd number of entries, right? If it's even, okay, so let's say we have something like this. Let's say we have 4, 5, 6, 8, 8, and 10, okay? So if you have these, um, this set of data right here, then there's no value that sits in the middle. You find these two, you find the average. So uh, 6 plus 8 divide by 2, that's 7, right? Okay, um, and then mode is the most frequent one. So we, we can have situation where we have no modes if no value repeats more than one, okay, or doesn't repeat at all, right? So then we have one mode, two mode, three, and so forth, okay? So what is the thing that we need to remember? Mean is very sensitive to outliers, okay? So sensitive to outliers. What does it mean? If one of the values is very large or very small, the mean is not a good representation of the average value of the set. Okay? Median is a much better representation. And that's why a lot of times you hear statisticals, uh, statistical results of a study and they will mention that the median is this. Um, because if the data is not normally distributed, a lot of times the mean is not representative. Okay? For example, let me, let me give you a quick example. Let's imagine you have um, a restaurant. Okay? So imagine some restaurant, I don't know, let's say, Panera bread. Okay, uh, think about the average salary of all people that are at that Panera bread at that particular moment. So let's say on Monday morning, ten thirty, you have some representation of the average salary of people. Okay, now um, then let's say we have Donald Trump walks in into this Panera bread restaurant. And then the average salary goes way up, right? Because, of course, he's making a lot of money. Um, but that means what? The average now is not a good representation of the people that sit in this restaurant okay? because of this one outlier. And that's why we say that mean is sensitive to outliers. Median, not so much. It's not sensitive to outliers at all because you can add one very small or very large value and it's not going to change much, if at all. Okay, so this is how we deal with measures of center. Okay, let's keep going. What was the next thing? The next thing that we talked about is measures of spread. And here we had, uh, let's see, range. 
and that was computed by the maximum value minus the minimum, right? Okay, um, this one is really just used to kind of get an idea um, where the values live, okay? So what is the range that you need to focus on, let's say, when you're coming up with a graph, okay? Then we talked about standard deviation. Standard deviation, the notation for this one, and this is actually important, sigma or s, right? Okay, and I would like for you to start recognizing which one is which right away. So this is population standard deviation. This tells you the distance of, on average, how far the values are from the mean. Okay, that's what standard deviation is saying. Now, S of X is what? This is sample standard deviation. Okay, and um, in this chapter, it's not as important to recognize which one is which, but in uh, chapters 7 and all the way up to 10, it will be crucial for you guys to understand that sigma and s are two different things. They are the same measure. One is standard deviation of a population, though. The other one is of a sample. Okay, now these two, again, are computed with calculator command. Um, you would go to stat and do one variable statistics. You never need to know or to compute any of these things by hand, okay? And it will actually produce these two. So, whichever the problem is asking you for, that's what you would use as your standard deviation, okay? And then uh, we talked about variance just briefly. Uh, variance is um, the square of standard deviation um, and in this class we really don't spend too much time on it okay so if you don't feel comfortable with variance don't worry about it um, this is a more sophisticated um, concept and um, higher more higher level um, statistic courses talk about it more we will not focus on this so the main um, concept here is standard deviation knowing which one you're using will be crucial when you guys are doing hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. So, standard deviation, sigma s and sx, um, population and sample standard deviation. Okay, let's talk about the empirical rule. What is this rule? I'll remind you real quick what it looks like. If you have a bell-shaped distribution or approximately normal, okay, what can we say about the data? Well, we can say that about 68% of all data is within one standard deviation, right? So if you have your mean sits right here, then this one, uh, this value right here is mean plus one standard deviation, this one is mean plus two standard deviation, and this one is mean plus three standard deviation, okay? Within two, you have exactly, six, well, approximately 68%, okay? I'm sorry, within one. Within one standard deviation, we have about 68%. Within two standard deviation, we have 95%, right? And then within three, almost all of it. 99.7. Okay? The empirical rule is approximation, but it's a pretty good one. It's a pretty good approximation, right? The only problem is it doesn't give us much of a variation, right? So we can only do plus within one, two, and three standard deviation. But once we've covered chapter, let's see which one, six, which you already have, you guys know that if you use normal CDF, then you can find percentage of, of any bounds that you want to set up, right? So I have a video that goes through this process in a lot of detail. So if you would like to go back and um, watch it, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through an example um, in a lot of details how to do it, how to um, how to break down these parts right here in uh, percentages. Okay, so you should know how to use the empirical rule uh, for the midterm. Okay, and then what about the last thing? 
measures of position. There's a couple of things that we discussed here. Um, the first thing is z-scores. Okay. Um, these scores tell you how far away from standard deviation you are in a more normalized manner. Okay, so these scores are distance from the mean, and they can be negative and positive, right? So if the z score is negative, then your value is below the mean. If it's positive, it's above. Okay, how do we compute it? The z score is computed by whatever the value that you got minus the mean divide by standard deviation if it's a sample right so this is how you would compute a z-score and then what would be a good problem to remember um there was a problem on one of the activities that we did uh, about um tina and anna scores right so tina and anna took a took test right so the two different classes they took their test and then tina had a higher raw score right and it didn't have as much of a um not not as high right so then when you compare the z score that tell you how well they did relative to their classes you guys told me well most of you did and it was correct that anna actually did better because her z score was higher okay so if you take a look let's say this data is normally distributed so Tina's was somewhere here, and Anna's was somewhere here. I can't quite remember what the numbers were, but Anna's scores was just a little bit higher, so she did better. Now, what is the common mistake that I see a, a lot? A lot of times, students will compute these correctly, and then they'll say, Tina did better because her score is closer to the mean is closer to the mean okay but that that doesn't mean good right so in this case that's not a that's not correct conclusion okay and Tina did not do better because yes her score is closer to the mean but in this situation that's not necessarily a good thing okay if they did it like this then okay if this was tina if this was anna yes tina is closer to the mean but more importantly her score is higher okay so always think um in the in the context of the problem would it make sense if it was better um if it was closer to the mean well in this case no because they're actually on the other side right so they're both higher than mean so you want and in this case you want to say what um anna did better because her score is higher okay so um a problem like this is on a test and i might ask you guys okay here's a situation use statistical evidence to show that okay well whatever the result is right so justify your answers compute the z scores and you write out um whatever your conclusion is okay so this was measure of position and then the other thing that we talked about was um five number summary and box plot right box plot okay um and again you guys did really well on this part i had very i've seen very little trouble just minor mistakes here and there probably just not paying attention but overall um i don't recall that there was any problems at all again uh you plug in your data in let's say l1 then you do one variable statistics l1 it gives you all of the values it's going to give you the minimum right the maximum it's gonna give you q1 q2 which is the median and q3 okay so i'm gonna ask you guys to construct construct a box plot um so what do you do use a calculator to do this okay what i would do i would use a calculator to come up with box plot and then just sketch it okay so let's say you have data that looks something like this okay that's the box plot that you got um then let's see what does it look like well this one is what it has a tail or this is a longer whisker right so whisker on the right so this box plot is right skewed okay you might also have some outliers so let's say there is a outlier over here 
okay, and then just mark it. So um, use your calculator to graph it, then sketch it um, on your paper. Um, mark everything. Here's your minimum, right? Okay, so min, um, Q1, Q2, Q3, and then max, okay? And here you have an outlier, right? Okay, so um, what can go wrong here? Um, really not much. The only thing that can happen if you, um, by accident, plug in your numbers incorrectly, but typically that that doesn't happen. So if you just carefully plug in your numbers in the columns in your calculator um, and graph the box plot, if you need to know how to do it, I also have a video about it. So video about graphing, oops, too far, too far. I went up too far. Okay, so there we go. We're back to normal. So video where I talk about uh, how to construct the box plot on a calculator. Um, so you can watch this, but um, again, um, this problem typically has very little issues. Okay, so let's just see. Let's just review real quick. What do we do? Measures of center, measures of spread the empirical rule, and measures of position. I think that's everything. All right, thank you for watching.